Um, first one up, Zach Manchester, uh, Carnegie Mellon, kilometer scale space structures. Hi, my name is Zach Manchester from Carnegie Mellon University, and together with my co-investigator Jeff Lipton from Northeastern, we are studying a new class of very large deployable structures that could be launched by a single rocket. Our motivation for doing this is the long-held dream of sustaining human presence beyond Earth. As we've learned over the past few decades, long-duration spaceflight poses serious challenges for the human body, including muscle atrophy, bone loss, and eyesight degradation, many of which are linked to a lack of gravity. Concepts for rotating space habitats that provide crew with artificial gravity at their outer extremes and microgravity environments near their central spin axis date back more than a century. But there's a big problem with this idea. Coriolis effects cause disorientation, discomfort, and motion sickness in humans when spin rates are more than just a few RPM. To produce artificial gravity near 1G at rotation rates of 1 to 2 RPM below the threshold where people suffer from motion sickness would require a structure on the order of a kilometer long. What are we trying to do? We are building high expansion ratio deployable structures, herds, that can be one kilometer long and deployed from a single launch. We will create artificial gravity for human crews by spinning these structures. To do this, we are designing and testing new hierarchical metamaterials through prototyping, modeling, and analysis. Who cares? Astronauts who want to avoid microgravity related health risks, mission planners who want to enable long duration crewed missions, engineers working on space systems who are interested in lightweight deployable structures, astronomers interested in space-based optical or radio interferometry with large baselines, and of course, the public, who will benefit from having the ability to deploy large structures quickly and easily, enabling things like pop-up bridges and cell towers. These designs may even have benefits at much smaller scales, such as stents. Our analysis is in the context of two future mission concepts, Lunar Gateway and Mars Transit Vehicle. For both of these missions, we seek to understand the impacts on crew health and safety, robustness of the structure's damage, operational constraints, and the possible new science that could be done with access to both 1G and microgravity environments on board. We've also made estimates of the cost and mass of the full system and made direct comparisons to tether-based systems for producing artificial gravity. Herds are a network of rotating beams that reconfigure from a stowed state into a deployed state. We organize these beams into a two-layer hierarchical structure. The superstructure is based on the design of mechanical metamaterials, and the substructure is based on traditional scissor mechanisms. The superstructure and substructure patterns combine to give us the 50x expansion ratio we need. Locks dispersed throughout rigidize the herds in the deployed state. We investigated various locking mechanisms and determined that a rotary ramp joint gave us the best stiffness, compactness, and manufacturability. This lets us make scissor mechanisms that can deploy and lock. Scissor mechanisms are a natural choice for our expanding structure, but they lack the stiffness we need. Triangular trusses are stiff, but cannot be stowed as compactly. We created pop-up expanding truss structures, or PETs, to solve this problem. PETs stow in a flexible, low-profile state and then as they expand, develop more pronounced triangular profile. Using these rotary ramps, these structures can be locked when fully deployed. To drive the expansion ratio of our structure, there are two key mechanisms. The first is a rotation that converts distance in the cross section of a cylinder into length along the axis. The second is the expansion of the structure along its length. We combine both of these to generate the high expansion ratios we need. Last year, we looked at one structure, the handed shearing oxetic. These convert lengths along the circumference of a cylinder into length along the axis as they unfurl. This year, we expanded our analysis to include the Kresling pattern that converts cord lengths into axial lengths. We found that Kresling has several advantages in this application, as it allows for redundancy in the cells, eliminates the need for compliance, and makes manufacturing modular. Next, we set out to build a functioning prototype of a herds to validate our design and test its ability to deploy and lock. We built two unit cells at one-tenth scale. This required over 1,500 individual 3D printed parts, all printed in-house on three 3D printers running nonstop for almost two weeks, 
and the equivalent of 80 person hours of hand assembly by a team of six students. The final prototype has a collapsed thickness of five centimeters and a fully extended length of over two and a half meters for an expansion ratio of just over 50x. You can see the collapsed state on the left, the twist and extension coupling during deployment in the center, and the fully deployed and locked 2.5 meter configuration on the right. At full scale, this would comfortably allow a one kilometer structure to fit inside a single Falcon Heavy fairing. In parallel with our hardware prototyping and design efforts, we've also been building simulation tools at varying levels of fidelity. At the lowest level, we have detailed link level simulations of the pop-up expanding truss structures to use in design studies and to understand their bulk stiffness properties. At the cell level, we treat each truss as a single beam with properties extracted from the link level simulation to understand the deployment and flexible dynamics of large numbers of unit cells. Finally, we're currently working on scaling our simulation tools up to the point where we can perform large scale simulations of the entire herd system with millions of degrees of freedom. This will help us model complex transient behaviors like jamming during deployment. So far, we've managed to simulate deployment of spinning structures with 10 unit cells and over 1100 degrees of freedom on a single desktop workstation. We've also begun using these simulation tools to optimize placement of thrusters and momentum actuators along the structure to maneuver it while simultaneously suppressing low frequency flexible modes, as would be necessary during delta V maneuvers for station keeping. We're also looking into jamming during deployment and how we might mitigate this with extensive Monte Carlo simulations. We're in the process of building hardware suitable for a zero G test flight to ensure that our models align with the behavior of the physical system. We envision a variety of other applications for HERDs, including low frequency radio astronomy, communications and power infrastructure on the lunar surface, and civil infrastructure on Earth. We hope that our work on high expansion ratio deployable structures brings us closer to the dream of long-term large-scale human activity in space. We'd like to thank NIAC for its continued support of this work. If you have any questions or comments, don't hesitate to reach out to either of us. Thank you. As a uh, final plug, we have lots of toys uh, that will be <laughs> at our poster next door, so come by if you want to see these things and play around. Very cool work. Um, Igor Bargatin from University of Pennsylvania. Um, maybe I missed it, but you said you did a comparison to a tether system, and what was the result? Yeah, so I think uh, the, the major um, thing that we can do that a tether can't do is provide uh, stiffness, right? Okay. So you can push on this. That's fair. You, you can't on a tether. We have looked at uh, mass and robustness comparisons as well, uh, which are in our, our phase one report oh, from I see. Uh, a little bit ago. We're happy to discuss more okay. of that and okay. share the docs. Um, and then the other question is, so these systems from, you know, just, I'm not an expert on these structures, but um, they look like they're bend and dominated in all, in all designs. So I, I wonder if you ever consider it, or if it's possible to make structures, some of these rotating ones seem to be uh, tension dominated, um, at least under some uh, deformations, which is known to be more efficient from the mass point of view. Um, so I wonder if you considered any of that. Yeah, so we looked at it in, do you wanna, oh, sorry, I have the mic. We looked at the original structure, so the, the HSAs were what we showed in the phase one, and they are tension dominated, they have that advantage. The problem we came into was um, making an accurate model in all of the cross coupling in those structures was quite difficult to give us the confidence that would actually uh, be robust and work. And so when we switched to the system where we have linear compressive loads without the bending component in the structure, we were able to more accurately model them and gave us the confidence that our, our simulations were really accurate and get, telling us that, yes, it could take these compressive loads and we could make it work and, and lock them out, and additionally give us the advantage of having this cellular redundancy, right? So the Kresling, if one cell doesn't deploy, um, that's fine, the rest of the structure deploys. In the HSAs, it's all entirely cross-coupled, so if one cell jams, you have ripple effects throughout the entire system. Okay, thank you. A great presentation, uh, great work. Uh, Dexter Johnson, NASA Technical Fellow for Loads and Dynamics. 
I was just curious, uh, did you have consideration for damping and considering the lightweight structures as well as in terms of the joint mechanisms and so forth? Is that in your model and that's in consideration of your design? So I'll take the first one. Uh, as far as damping, uh, so the idea that we're mostly pursuing here is, is actually to actively uh, control these modes with okay. uh, momentum actuators distributed throughout the structure, which you'd need for attitude control anyway, um, which the theory being that you'd save a lot of weight being able to do this with active control rather than uh, passive dampers. And the joint one, I think Jeff might have some Yeah, so the on. individual joints, our, our main concern right now has been jamming and redundancy and failure. Mm -hmm. um, the model that we showed the video of, uh, you can't tell, but at least seven or eight of them are broken. And so it works quite well. There's enough internal redundancy to make this system robust to certain part failures. And then our major concern then has been locking the joints to provide them to, to basically have that compliance and free move and then quickly lock and maintain that stable state. Mm -hmm. So right now we're just using mechanical locks. One idea we're really interested to explore is uh, RF welding so that post lock you could actually fully bond the joint together, and then the joint would basically cease to exist. Thank you. Just a quick follow-up on active control. So it seemed like that will be focusing on the low frequency. So it seemed like you mentioned mostly low frequency, any consideration for the high frequency, because you may have to consider some other active structural materials that for some of the high frequency. Yeah, I think. Um, Higher frequency, sorry. It depends. I guess it's all relative, but there are some really <laughs> low-frequency modes at mm -hmm. this scale, um, like subhertz, and those are the ones that I think we're most worried about. That's what I thought. Um, I think as far as the, the sort of actuation and, and active control stuff goes, um, I, I don't think it's a problem to go up into like you know the several hertz range with that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's really a question of you know ultimately bandwidth uh, on exactly. the controller, which I think. Mm -hmm. You can go pretty high, so I don't, I don't know. You know, okay. there's also questions of passive safety there. What happens if the control loop fails and, and all this other stuff? So I think there's a lot of questions there, but that's kind of what we've been looking at the most recently. All right, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, Paul Sutter from the Flatiron Institute. Uh, fascinating work. I'm very curious about deployment. Presumably in space you won't have astronauts like yanking on either end. So what is the deployment mechanism that you're envisioning and how do you maintain the structural integrity during the deployment phase, which presumably might take a while? Yeah, this is a really, really fun problem. Uh, so <laughs> some of the simulation results in there, there was, there was kind of hints of this. Um, we've been trying to look at uh, if we can spin this thing up and use uh, centrifugal force basically to pull it apart. Um, I'd say the o overall the deployment of this thing terrifies me. Uh, it's got so many moving parts and, and so many uh, degrees of freedom. And uh, there's all this kind of weird transient behavior that's changing constantly. Ugh. Yeah, that's not great. Uh, <laughs> that uh, while it's deploying, right? So I think um, the potential for jamming is tremendous. So we've been trying to look at clever ways to, to avoid that. Uh, what, as Jeff mentioned, one of the nice things about this Kresling structure is that it's totally modular. And if one or two of these unit cells jams, it's not the end of the world. It's, you still get most of what you need. But yeah, I, I think the, the deployment dynamics are really, really Fine. messy and complicated. We've tried modeling this in various ways, and we've looked at uh, a bunch of, the, the jamming problem is actually kind of fascinating. I could nerd out about this for a while if you want to <laughs> talk more about it. Um, there's actually like really, really interesting uh, different mechanisms that can, that can lead to the jamming. And um, uh, having flexibility in there just makes it all the more messy to model. Yeah. So it's, it's really, really, it's a really tough problem. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Amber Duville, APL. Uh, I was gonna ask, so you talk about failure from the jamming. Have you actually looked at how many of, well, let's say, how many of the joints can fail post deployment and, you, and how that affects your stiffness of the overall structure? So we, we haven't looked at this in a rigorous analytical way. Uh, mm -hmm. We have, I, I would say, like uh, accidentally uh, have a lot of anecdotal uh, experience with this, with uh, building these things. Um, they're, they're fairly robust to individual links breaking. Uh, we built this with you know like a couple thousand links and a lot of them broke, uh, and we ended up fixing it a bunch of times and it it, it does kind of still <laughs> still work. Um, I, I think there's a really fascinating question in there about uh, how you build robustness into a structure like this and and like actually plan for individual link failures in a statistical sense. I think it's a really cool problem. We haven't really dug into it 
Uh, but I think there's a, a ton of cool things to do in that yeah, direction. And I would just say that we, we just got to the point where we can actually simulate the whole thing. So now that we can simulate it, we can start asking these questions in simulation. Thank you. Hi, Amy Cronenberg here. Um, I think what you're doing is really terrific. And Thanks. I can see a lot of applications for it, but the one that really comes to mind is in disaster relief. Uh, we have seen in many uh, settings on the, on the earth in the last couple of years, and even very recently, sadly, a lot of opportunities where uh, restoring the ability to get across a flooded area or uh, shore up again uh, around uh, an area where there's been a bad earthquake. Um, I think you've got a great opportunity uh, in that setting for what you're working on. Yeah, thank you. Because think... things can be, you know, stored in it easily, presumably trucked over to somewhere or flown over to somewhere and just put in place right away. And I can think of a lot of communities that would benefit from that. Yeah, just totally just agreed. A, Thanks for that point. I think the one thing along those lines that we have thought about is um, trying to drop in uh, basically radio towers or cellular towers quickly with something like this. Yeah. Thanks. Although vertically would make great tent poles for big tops, you know, great, great big, well, not just for circus. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, this is this is great stuff. I love how you guys have so quickly converted from your attention-based tether um, simulating um, uh, applications to those that use the inherent strengths of this system, which are torsional um, and and compressive. Um, and and I, and I really think you guys have done a great job um, in in correcting that problem. Um, my friends at Viasat are, of, of course, in great mourning over the fact that they could do nothing about their billion-dollar um, communication satellite that had a jam. And so that brings up what, of course, is something that really ought to correlate with you, and somebody ought to do a companion NIAC, and that is robotic climber repair, uh, uh, because you would absolutely count on that. So we can talk about that further. I'd love uh, to talk about this. Uh, there's, yeah, we, we've thought about this. So it, well, I think that it's, it's a separate topic. Yeah, 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 agreed. And yet it would let you sleep nights if you yeah. knew that somebody else was working on it. Finally, it looks to me as if these devices could be nested with each other. There could be nested effects that would uh, uh, solve a lot of your problems if you erect one and then you erect another one next to it or or uh, circumscribing it, that uh, especially if augmented with robotics uh, to make welds and, and all that sort of thing, you could, you could wind up solving a lot of your problems that way. So there's a really cool device that has almost been lost to history called the Sawyer Roto Stand. Uh, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with it. It was a pop-up stand for uh, projectors. And it was based on a similar principle, and it took two layers inside of each other to deploy and lock, and lock them against each other to add extra rigidity. And so it's definitely possible to use this, like you're saying, for a single launch, get a global structure, and then if you could do a concentric layer lock between them to further enhance the rigidity, it would just mean that we would have to do kilometer scale space structure from a two launch uh, well, Either that or they could be circumferential, and you can do them in stages. On the same, in any event, I didn't mean to tell you your business. <laughs> <laughs> quick. Yes, I did. Yeah. Very quick one. Oh, yeah. over time. Very quick one from online from uh, uh, Lani or, or Lenny. Wait, some apologies there. How much room is inside? Uh, would be inside of a kilometer truss the, in, the interior volume. A lot. Yeah. Well, uh, so the the diameters we're looking at are like six meters, like sort of uh, five to six meters, like the biggest kind of fairing diameters. Uh, that would be, uh, so in theory, I could go inside. The outer things. diameter of this thing would be like six meters. Uh, okay. So once it's expanded, you have all that internal volume. Yeah. So. Very cool. Thank you. You use a lot of that internal volume though in the deployed stowed or the stowed state. So you wouldn't have it pre-launch. You'd have it post-launch. Right. No. Sir. Yeah. Right. All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.